Hi, this is Mark Buckley, here to walk you through a presentation that I gave to the Bristol Bay RSDA public meeting in November of 2009. I'm going to talk about improving the quality and profitability of Bristol Bay salmon. And this uh, presentation is geared primarily toward the Bristol Bay Drift Fleet, but it's also valuable, I think, for tender operators and people who run seafood processing plants. I want to mention that the work that I did was funded by the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association. Uh, I'm very grateful there for their funding and I hope to continue a relationship with them. They're an excellent organization. This study seeks to answer or at least address two key questions. First of all, what, is the, what affects the quality of a Bristol Bay salmon from the time it's caught to the time it arrives at the processing plant? And how can the Bristol Bay salmon industry improve quality given the constraints of the fishery. And I think we understand what the constraints are. If you've been around the bay for a while, you know that we've got a real high volume operation with the fish come in all at once. Um, and our model in Bristol Bay for a long time has been to basically pack in as many pounds as you can as quickly as you can. And so this is a significant uh, obstacle to improving the quality because we have this volume driven model. My personal story started in Bristol Bay in 1979 when I bought a Bristol Bay permit and I fished in Bristol Bay until 2001 when I had a disastrous season. I came away owing way more money than I made and uh, in 2002 I received an offer from the University of Alaska to travel around Alaska and to investigate the quality that, um, uh, of, of salmon fisheries around the state to do quality research. And I continued to do that right up until um, last summer 2009 and hope to continue doing so in 2010. In 2005, I had the opportunity to go to Japan and I toured the famous Skiji market. Uh, and I was given a tour by a major salmon buyer at Skiji. He took me around the market and showed me room after room filled with cases and cases, hundreds, thousands of cases of fresh farm salmon from Chile, Norway, uh, New Zealand, Canada, and, uh, and I was shocked by the volume of farmed salmon. Finally, I asked him, where's the Alaska salmon? And he looked around and saw a small pile of half a dozen or so wetlock boxes in a corner, and he said, well, there they are. And I said, well, uh, why? What's, what's the reason that you're buying all this farm fish and no Alaska fish? And he said, look, um, the quality's a problem. He said, you open up a box of Alaska salmon and you're re never really sure what you're going to get. Sometimes it's very good stuff and sometimes uh, you have to throw a lot of it away or cut it away because there's so much bruising and mishandling of the fish. Uh, I asked him about Bristol Bay fish and he thought Bristol Bay fish were pretty much far down on the list. They were not the preferred fish that he would buy from Alaska and he wasn't buying very many at all at that point. Um, I asked him about the... Uh, uh, the farm fish industry and do the Japanese public have any bias against farm fish and he said no not at all and in fact um, when I traveled around Japan you can see this photograph here many 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 bays in Japan look like this these are all aquaculture floats out there for a variety of things and um, many bays in Japan are, um, are just completely choked with aquaculture they actually have to make channels through all the aquaculture for the boats to get in and out of the harbor so his representation to me about not being interested in buying Alaska salmon is borne out by this graph right here produced by the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game. What we're looking at here, the, the blue bars represent the salmon harvest from 1989 until 2008. And then the red line with the blue dots along it represent the number of large processors in Bristol Bay. And what we're seeing is that in 1989, there were approximately 30 large processors in Bristol Bay, but by uh, 2007, the number had fallen to fewer than 15. So what we're looking at here is um, you can see that when the number of processors was high and the fish abundance was high, the catch was also high, which stands to reason because the processing capacity was there to handle large runs. But then as uh, the number of processors dropped, the catches also dropped, and this isn't reflecting what happened out uh, in, in nature. There were still lots of fish, but catches have dropped. And of course, we're seeing this. We're being put on limits, and we're having over-escapement, or we're having excess escapement up in the rivers. So this dramatically shows how the catches have been affected by the number of processors in Bristol Bay. And it's my thesis that the number of processors has dropped because the value to the processors has dropped. Some of them went out of business. Some of them consolidated and so forth. 
uh, the value drop because the farm fish have come in and they have taken place in places in markets that previously were occupied by Alaska salmon. So the Bristol Bay RSDA funded two studies in 2009 and the first one is the handling practices study and what I did was I went and traveled to Igigik and I lived aboard the tenders that were delivering for one cannery, one processing facility. Uh, I lived in Agagic on the tenders, and I rotated from tender to tender, and I would ask fishermen to go out on their boats during regular openings and to perform specific tasks for the fish they were catching. Um, I told them that to do these specific tasks and then to put those fish from that set into brailers that were separate from the other brailers in their fish holes. So they, those fish were kept separate. And then when they came and delivered their fish to the uh, tender, I would tag those fish. And so, uh, and then those fish would travel on the tender to the plant, and then they would be removed in the plant. The tags would be removed, the tag fish separated out in the plant and graded um, per um, standards, as ASME standards in some cases, and uh, plant standards in other cases, so that we could um, we could get an idea of how specific handling practices affected the fish. And in 2009, I tagged 2,100 fish, 2,100 and change, and we recovered about 1,600 and change, so my recovery rate was about 76%. And I will have to say that the fleet that I was working with, by default, almost all the boats had RSW. Uh, so the, the, the boats, one of the, one of the variables I took out of the study was the RSW variable. We are going to study whether um, RSW or chilling makes a difference. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the vast majority of these boats had RSW, so, um, so uh, we're talking about RSW handled fish unless I specify otherwise. So what I wanted to um, ascertain was, first of all, I wanted to get benchmarks for the very best quality salmon we can find in Bristol Bay. How can we deliver the highest quality fish and what does that percentage look like? So what we did was I asked the fishermen to go out and make short sets uh, and to try to emulate as closely as you can with the gillnet fishery what, the, um, what a troller does, what a salmon troller does on his boat, which is to say that the fish come alive, they're abor they're, they're, uh, the fish come alive aboard, aboard alive, they're still wiggling, they, um, they get stunned very quickly, they get bled very quickly, they're handled gently, and then they're placed into deep refrigerated seawater, that is to say not just thrown into a dry fish hold or even a shallow seawater hold and we try to keep our brailler weights low, less than 200 pounds. So what we discovered was that the percentage of number ones in this scenario was 86%, 14% uh, number twos, and no percent number threes. In contrast, we wanted to look at some deliberate um, mishandling practices that we all know as fishermen and people in the industry cause real problems with our fish. And in this case, right here on the second, uh, you know, grid that we're looking at here on this page, what we're seeing is I asked the fishermen to do uh, take some fish off the bottom of a stern hull. So what happened was they were in some pretty hot fishing. They kept their net in the water until the very last moment in the uh, fish, fishing period. They stern hauled the net very quickly. There were 450 to 500 fish in the hull. And, uh, and then what happened was they basically took their time um, getting those fish out of that uh, hull and the bottom of the fish, some fish off the bottom of the hull, they put into this one brailer, and we uh, tagged those fish and sent them into the plant. And by the way, this, we did this with several different hulls. It wasn't just one time. Well, the average number percent of number ones from the bottom of the stern hull, of course, these fish, because of the way that they were um, taken out of, the, um, out of the gill net and then delivered immediately to the tender, they really weren't bled and they really weren't chilled. They'd been dead for some time by the, came up, the time they came out of that stern hull. So we have 21% number ones and 59% number twos, 20% number threes. A huge difference in quality between the fish that were treated like as troll caught fish could, would have been.